So we talked about this. Um, I'm, you're probably familiar. Um, we have rewards for completing in-session tasks. I said, well, we've got a big prize box. We have stickers. We have lots of little junky things that parents hate for us to give out to kids because it's one more thing that gets you know, in the house. Um, but we have rewards for homework assignments that parents give. And of course, as you saw when we did the demonstration of the role play, um, and as I did when we were doing the reading, we have their extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. So the extrinsic rewards are, of course, um, things like giving fun money or giving stickers. And the intrinsic rewards are the good feelings that come from saying, great job, you know, you did well, keep going, you're doing a good job. So, and of course, as when we start, we do more extrinsic rewards, and then as we proceed in the program, we hope to move to more of intrinsic rewards and kids feeling good and, you know, kids coming in and say, I have a friend now, you know, or so-and-so invited me over to their party and I went and I had a good time. So those kinds of intrinsic rewards that we hope to build up to. Here's a little bit of the weekly reward contract. Um, I, Rob Jones, agree to introduce myself to two new kids at the swimming pool this week. Um, if I meet this goal, my reward will be to have my bedtime extended by 30 minutes on Saturday night. Okay. They sign it, parents sign it, it's a done deal, it's a contract. So what are some things that can go on that are some problems in exposure? Well, one of the things is finding the right tasks. Okay? And as you do more and more of these, you'll have your tried and, to, and, tried and true tasks. So, one we use that we've made up over the years is called the game of silly stuff. And the game of silly stuff is m nothing more than us thinking of stupid things that you could do, like, you know, walk and quack like a duck. Sing twinkle, twinkle little star at the top of your lungs. But what we've done is we've collected, oh, my favorite, my, you know, my favorite, um, tell a story about a lawnmower, peanut butter, um, and uh, what's this? I can't remember the third one now. Lawnmower, peanut butter, and you know, a desk chair or something. And so they have to put those three together to tell a story. Um, we put them all on slips of paper. We make it a game where, first of all, the kid, all, all the child has to do is pull out the strips and read it, and the therapist has to do the silly things. And then we take turns where the therapist does one silly thing, and then the child does the next silly thing, and on and on to bigger and bigger audiences. So it doesn't require a lot of money or a lot of time expertise. It just requires understanding what some of these um, different tasks are, what they tap into, and then having them available and going back and using them when they're appropriate for the different children in the different situations. Um, another one that we use a lot is we have a, a red Little Orphan Annie wig. So sometimes kid just puts the wig on and we hang out. Okay? Looks a little silly, but you know people look at you when you're wearing a Little Orphan Annie wig. So, but if you're afraid that people are going to look at you, that's what you got to do. You got to do something so people will look at you. So, um, a cat in the hat hat works the same thing. So, um, anything that call, calls attention to themselves. So, okay. yes. Another example I heard was going on a bus and paying with a lot of coins. Going on a bus and paying with a lot of like a lot of change, like penny by penny by penny. Yes. So as long as they don't irritate the bus driver too much, yes. Yeah, <laughs> the thing is, with something like that, you'd have to like, I would think you'd have to be getting on and off the bus a lot and doing it over and over and over again. So because that's the idea is, the idea is if you've done that thing and then you're just kind of hanging out on the bus, your anxiety is going back down because you're not doing that thing that is embarrassing anymore. So you have to, what you want to do is be able to get on and off the bus do it with lots of different times, and then you keep checking their anxiety as they're paying penny by penny. So that would be a good one. Yes? Um, since we're on the topic of identifying appropriate tasks, I was wondering if really young kids aren't able to verbalize very well why they might be um, shy about a certain situation. Mm -hmm. How can you tell if they are um, not doing a certain thing because they're afraid of making mistakes versus they're afraid their voice sounds funny. We, in a lot of times, we can't do that. So we just have to go with really young kids. We just have to go with, I'm scared. So, and we just work down from, I'm scared. So, 
Um, sometimes they can tell us, sometimes they, they just say, I'm really, I'm afraid. And sometimes if we're in the situation, we might say, well, why are you afraid? You know, not reflectively, like, why were you afraid? But, you know, you're now, you're in that situation, you're, you're scared. What are you thinking about? What are you worried about? What are you, you know, and so sometimes they'll say, they might say, like, people are looking at me or something like that. So, uh, okay. Um, again, People, adults and kids, need to really understand the rationale for the treatment. So lots of times adults will go, well, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to make her cry? Well, first of all, I don't want to make her cry. Right? That's not my goal is to make anybody cry. Um, and they probably won't cry as much as the parents think they'll cry. Uh, but to give them illustrations like I gave you, to explain the rationale, give them the illustrations of within session habituation, which is what happens within each session, and then between session habituation, where the anxiety gets less each time, the time to come back to baseline um, becomes shorter, to give them that kind of rationale, and to show them after the session. I always sit down with the child and the parents and say, look, when we started, you were at a four, and then you went to a three, and then you went back to a four, because I told you you made a mistake. And then you went to a three, and then you went to a two, and, you know, and see how it came back down, and we didn't stop. We just kept doing it. And after a few sessions, I'll show them the between session habituation, the progress that they've made. Look at how you're doing. You don't get nearly as scared anymore when you have to do this. So, okay. And again, um, as I said, kids might try to cope during the procedure because none of us likes to do things that scare us. So like I said, we want them to walk backwards and they walk sideways or they kind of walk sideways. So um, to try and encourage them to get them to do it. If they can't walk backwards, maybe they can just stand backwards. You know, another good task is going into an elevator and facing the back wall. Okay, that gets a lot of people, you know, because what do we do when we go into the elevator? We go into the elevator, we turn around, we face the door. Okay, go into the elevator and stand with your back to the door and stand staring at the wall. People wonder what you're doing. Okay, so um, you might want to, I once had security come and ask me what I was doing in the hospital because I was standing, we were standing with our back to the wall. So sometimes if you, you know, are doing something like that in a public place, you might want to just check it out first and tell people, you know, you don't have to tell them exactly what you're doing, but, you know, I'm a therapist, we're working on something. So, you know, we're going to be standing with our backs to the elevator um, door. So keeps you from having to explain later. So. Um, as I said, some people do relaxation training with this. Um, I don't uh, because I'd rather just use a lower level of anxiety and I don't want the kids to be distracted. Um, some people will do some cognitive restructuring. Again, that's just my own personal um, thought not to do that because I want them to really just focus on what they're doing. We might talk about it later about how they expected Everybody was going to be looking at them, and in reality, only that one person even looked at them while they were doing that. So you can talk to them about it later, that see, not everybody was looking at you. Um, of course, if you truly have a, a phobic or anxiety disorder, they're going to say, yeah, but the next time, everybody will be looking at me. So we don't do it in a way to try and take away their fears, but we do talk about it later, like what really happened? Did people really look at you? Okay, what can we do next time that might make people look at you more? Yeah. All right, I just put some um, muscle tension relaxation procedures in here. Um, again, as we talked about earlier today, you need to consider the child's level of cognitive development when you do some of these procedures. But um, in adolescence, some of the things they fear are not things that you can really do in real life. So you may need to have them imagine it. You would do imaginal um, exposure in the exact same way. But you would just have them playing it over and over again in their head, telling you what it is they're thinking about, describing it to you, um, telling you what the people are thinking, that they're thinking that you're stupid, that they're thinking that you don't know what you're doing, um, that you look like a dork, whatever it might be, um, and have them just do that. Again, check their suds level every 10 minutes. Watch for it to go down, and the session when, when they've habituated to that particular task. Um, to just sort of hammer home the point about developmental levels, there are several scripts, relaxation scripts, that are available 
Um, if you'd like them, you can email me and I will have, um, we will send them to you. But if you think about relaxation training with really young kids and you tell them to tense the muscles in their left hand, probably don't know what you mean by that, right? But if you tell them to pretend they have a lemon in their hand and squeeze the lemon to make lemonade, they're going to tense the muscles in their left hand, okay? Um, they're going to do what you need them to do. You've just given them a visual and something they can cling on to. The same thing if you want them to tense the muscles in their stomach, you can tell them to tense the muscles in their stomach, or you can tell them that, you know, imagine they're laying flat and a cute baby elephant is going to step on their stomach and they need to pull in their stomach muscles really tight so the cute baby elephant doesn't hurt them, okay? But you don't want to tell a cute baby elephant story to a 14-year-old. So in a 14-year-old, you, you would use the one that's on the right-hand side of the slide there where you would really just talk about tensing various muscles and relaxing them. Okay? So again, depending on the age of the child, you, know, you might want to say tense your shoulders by bringing them up to your ears, or you might want to say pretend you're a turtle and you have to pull your head into your shell. Okay? So again, it accomplishes, accomplishes the same thing but you're doing it based on the, where you're meeting the child where they are with their developmental level. Okay. Um, cognitive restructuring might be something like germs can't live very long on a doorknob. It may be dirty, but I probably won't die. That would be if you had OCD. Um, but a lot of times kids will make this into a ritual. So that person really didn't think I was stupid, but the next person is going to think I'm stupid. So um, that person didn't really laugh at me, but the next person will. So you don't want to, um, in many cases, it's better not to try and have them just do cognitive restructuring without exposure. You really have to have the exposure element. All of the CBT programs for adults, for kids, for looking at anxiety, any kind of anxiety disorder, whether it's social phobia, PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, whatever it might be, exposure is the key ingredient. All the other things might help, but it's not going to work if you don't have exposure in some form. Yes? Would you be more inclined to do these uh, relaxation training and cognitive restructuring techniques in a case like generalized anxiety disorder where much. exposure might be more difficult? Right, much more so. so in terms of GAD, because again, it's a little bit more difficult sometimes to get a handle on the worry. So, but, okay. And um, having children use some coping phrases, so, you know, I can do this, same thing you're telling them, you're doing a great job, okay? You, you can do this, you can beat this, you know, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. One thing I was thinking about, this is in cognitive restructuring, this is something I do with a lot of our kids and even the adults too that go with it go through um, the program is uh, um, as we go through exposure, uh, I talk to them about how, well, let me back up a little bit. When, when, during the assessment process, you'll find a lot of these people that they'll, they'll say that uh, social situations and uh, interactions become very aversive to them, so, because they've been, they've paired that with anxiety, but anxiety is a very aversive thing. So a lot of them, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of kids, they'll say, I don't even want friends, you know, but they do want friends, but it's just, it's become so scary for them to, to imagine, you know, having friends, having to interact with them. They'll say that, and the adults will say the same. Um, but, uh, it's, so it's not enjoyable for them. I, I don't think sometimes they, they don't think, like, this is an enjoyable thing, obviously, because they have a lot of anxiety during it. But something I'll, I'll point out and I'll ask them about is we're going through a treatment, and after we've done a couple rounds of exposure and, and gone through the social skills training, they've had a lot of successful interactions, I'll ask, have you noticed that it's becoming any more enjoyable? Or I'll say, you see how, how fun that was? Because we'll have conversations where we'll be laughing and, and joking about things. And I had a patient, I did this recently, and the patient goes, yeah, I never thought, you know, I never thought that I'd actually be laughing in a conversation. Because, well, mm -hmm. this person didn't talk for 17 years. But, you know, they, um, that's, yeah. it's an interesting thing. And you're not really restructuring any cognitions, but the thought process, I think, is changing. And, and their reaction to the situation is not only are they less anxious, but they're actually starting to enjoy these situations, which is something a lot of them never thought they would Mm -hmm. Probably they do. Would be able to do. Sure. Yeah. Um, you touched on an important point because lots of times people really are anxious or people think that children are too anxious um, or reluctant to engage in it. And sometimes that depends upon the therapist's experience too because you sometimes have to be willing to wait people out and particularly wait children out. Had one young lady who was afraid of playing her violin in front of people and she was actually, um, so we said, okay, we're going down to the park you're going to just play your violin. 
you know, that's all we're going to do today. So we went down, she came, a little teary-eyed, came down. It took her 45 minutes to get her music straight on the stand to begin playing. Obviously trying to delay doing this, thinking she was going to wait me out, but I was there for the duration. So after about 45 minutes, she finally decided she might as well play because she wasn't going home until we did. Um, she started to play. She didn't play very well, but she made five bucks by the time we were done because <laughs> people would throw money in her violin case. So she was playing. So, but again, once she started playing, her anxiety habituated in, you know, about 30 minutes. It really didn't take that long. But it's that anticipatory anxiety that sometimes can be so severe. And people will often be afraid to try something because they think it's going to be really, really awful. Turns out not to be so awful, but they're afraid it is. And so you have to be, as a therapist, enthusiastic, willing to wait them out, say, you know, it's okay, we'll just start whenever you're ready. You know, you know, hope we get home for dinner, but it's okay, we'll just start whenever you're ready, and sort of wait them out and get them started. And again, be willing to say, okay, just play one note. You know, okay, now play two notes. Okay, now let's really start playing. So uh, being able to use that. And lots of reinforcement, like you see with the fun money. So. Um, and parents sometimes have these negative expectations like, oh, you know, they're going to fall apart. You're going to be mean to my child. And, you know, my response is if I really wanted to be mean to your child, I wouldn't help them get over their social phobia. So, um, and sometimes having parents observe from a distance or through a one-way mirror can sometimes be helpful because they see the child really isn't falling apart. Um, that they may be a little anxious, but they're not really having this, you know, intensive reaction, intensive emotional response. Um, parents will often say, oh, he'll never do that, which is really very frustrating because, of course, the, kid will, the child will do it um, given the right circumstances. Okay. And the last is that you may not be able to replicate the exact fear. You may have to just get as close as you can. So, um, as I was saying, one of the reasons that in our new work we're starting to use more virtual reality is because it allows us to do things that we can't do in real life. So we can engineer situations, create things that we can't do in real life through the use of, of a virtual school. So you had a question? Yes, with regard to parents, so we talked about parents often exhibit a lot of the same anxiety symptoms mm -hmm. that their children are having. And so when I hear things about homework, like going to a place and dropping right. something very noisy, mm -hmm. which sounds like a great experience, how, how do you prepare the parents for that? If they themselves have a lot of anxiety? Yeah, I'd say, like, you're probably not going to like this either. But, um, and and if, if I think that the parent is not going to do that assignment, then I won't give them that as homework. I'll find something else that the child can do, or I'll see if maybe if dad doesn't have any social anxiety. or if I mean, we've often had situations where one kid is in the treatment program, the other kids appear. So, you know, we'll often say, well, you know, let, let Johnny take Billy, you know, out in the front street and drop coins or, you know, let Johnny take Billy and you stand over here away from them, just watch them. So we'll often engineer it. But you're right, if the parent has the same kind of social distress, they're not going to be um, able sometimes to actually take the child out and, and do those particular things. So you have to find another way. So. Okay. I think um, intensive exposure is, is flooding. I'm not sure. We don't do it that much. But basically, what we do with intensive exposure is we just don't bother with doing any kind of hierarchy. If Brian was afraid of reading in front of a group of strangers, I wouldn't bother with starting with his cousin. I'd just bring in a group of strangers and have him start reading in front of a group of strangers. Um, the one thing about exposure is that it works a lot faster. So you don't do any coping, um, but it, it works a lot faster because you're really starting at the top of the hierarchy. You don't have to work your way up through several different steps and do each one. You just go to the top and get it over with. Um, it will work quickly, but it will elicit more emotional response in people. Um, I don't do it with, with young kids because they don't often understand it. A lot of times adults will cry during the first exposure session, but it's okay. You know, my rule is if they cry, I've, I've got the right stimulus, so I know I'm going to be able to make them better. So um, 
you can you can do it if you need to do it quickly and sometimes people will come into your office and say well you know I've got to give this speech in three weeks you know and there's not much you can do in that case except have them come in daily and do do flooding in order to help them get over it um, Oh, just some graphs I can show you some within session habituation this was um, a real kid so um, that we had a, a situation had them um, I can't remember what the ta the task was again it was reading out loud it was, was this child was trying to read Jabberwocky um, in front just sort of in a public area where people could hear them going by okay so that's the first session that's their anxiety level that one took about 90 minutes to come back down but you can see as we go through the course of the treatment, you know, over the course of the sessions, doing the same thing, anxiety is lower at session number four, lower at session number seven, um, and lower at session number 10. So you can see that's exactly what it is that we're looking for and that we want to happen and that we show people. So we show them, here's the, you know, here's the graph, here's how you're doing. Look, look at the difference between number one and number seven. Look how much progress you're making. So the peak is less, the time to get back to baseline is less, and even the baseline is dropping. So. Okay. Um, again, if you're going to do intensive exposure more with adolescents than with young children, but if you're going to do it, does the child, does the adolescent understand what it is you're doing and why? You know, are they willing to go through this type of distress in order to get over their fear? Um, is the parent going to support you, or is the parent going to say you're, you know, you're upsetting my child? You can't do that. So, in which case, you're going to need to move to a gradual approach. Um, and if you have to do imaginal exposure, if what is they're afraid of you cannot reproduce in real life, um, does the child have or the adolescent have the capacity to hold that image? So, if they have to imagine themselves reading while 20 people laugh at them and point at them because they're reading poorly, can they do that for a sufficient period of time? Can they do that for um, 60 minutes, 70 minutes, 90 minutes, however long it takes for them to get back to baseline? Okay. So that's, you know, sort of the whole treatment program. We've kind of gone through um, and shown you the different conversational, the different skills in the social skills training group, the way that we do peer generalization and what that entails, and then the in vivo exposure sessions that we do using either a gradual or um, an intensive approach um, to habituation uh, exposure. Are there questions about any of, of that? Yes. Do you include Kids who are selectively mute in the same groups with I'm kids who are I'm so covered. glad you mentioned that because what happens is you start the group with one kid who's selectively mute and you could end up with six who are selectively mute by the end of the session. So because if the one kid's not talking, why do I have to talk? So what we usually do, I, I'm, I forgot to mention that, thank you. Um, what we do is we'll first take children who are selectively mute and we'll shape them to talk. So we'll first get them talking in small groups in front of different people, and then we'll put them into the group. Because otherwise, I have it, again, I have it on tape. It was amazing. It was, we talk about iatrogenic effects of therapy. I really started with one kid who wasn't talking, and by the time the 60 minutes was over, nobody would answer me. So nobody got to do the activity that day either. So. Um, A lot of those kids that are selectively mute because, or yeah, you can shape them to talk and they'll talk in various situations, but especially if they've been uh, avoiding like these social situations by like, not speaking for so long, chances are they, they don't have the, the social skills, the ability, you know, to interact. So the anxiety is still going to be there, and that, and the, the lack of skills is going to be there. So, um, or, in order for them to be successful, you know, it's important that they, I think, you, you still go through these, these social skills training um, groups with them or individually. Yeah. It's not just the talking, they still have skills. Yes, Sarah. Yeah. stuck in the in vivo, because I okay. just, I'm just imagining, I'm visualizing, you know, you're bowling and all that. And from what I understand, when they go home, there is no checking or telling, you know, of what they use or not. Like, they don't check with you, you know, with the person, with the staff, if they use anything that they learn. They just go home, and you're observing. I'm not sure if you are 
if well, there's any quantification of the skills that they were able to apply in the in vivo during that time? Well, or they come the next week and they tell you about they it? They have homework sheets, so they have to write down um, when they did their homework, what they did, who was there, how nervous they were. And so we do collect their homework sheets and we know on their homework sheets how many times they did their homework, um, whether or not they um, were successful at it. So we don't, we don't have people do exposure sessions without us because again, as I said, our, our exposure sessions are therapists accompanied because I want them to do it right. The homework assignments that we give them are much smaller in duration. It may be something like this week, say hello to the crossing guard every time you see them. And their job is just for homework to just say hello to the crossing guard on the way to school and on the way home from school every single day. And we do count those, so we do ask them to tell us if they did it or they don't do it. But we don't have them do exposure sessions um, with uh, the long, extensive exposure sessions without us being there because I just, as I said, my philosophy is if it was as easy as saying, well, just go do this, they would have done it. You know, they don't need us if, if all, because friends have told them that. Their parents have told them that. Don't be afraid. Just go talk to Jimmy, okay? But they don't just go talk to Jimmy because they are afraid. So um, just telling them to do something as an exposure assignment, particularly in the beginning, is not something that will work very well. So um, that's why what we give for homework is much shorter. So, okay? All right, just very few brief comments because I know we've all had a really long day. Um, we've talked about some of this, but some of the problems because no treatment is perfect, right? Um, attendance and participation in the groups. As I said, you do get kids sometimes who don't want to be there and they absolutely <coughs> refuse to participate in the group. If they don't participate in the group, they don't get to go to the activity. But guess what? They don't get to go home either. Okay, so they have to sit in the clinic for 90 minutes while the rest of us are out doing something fun. Okay, so they don't get, just like school refusal, they don't get to go home and watch TV and have, and have fun. They have to do something that's even more aversive than being in the group with us. So that's the way we kind of manage sometimes non-compliance in the group, along with timeouts and all the other things that one does in doing um, good behavioral management. And I said before, you can't be in the groups and not be an individual treatment. You have to do both. Right? Um, the cost and the time for peer activities, um, again, we try and find things that are inexpensive. We don't tell people, oh, we're taking all these kids who have a psychiatric do uh, disorder to come to your museum next week. We say, oh, we're a group from the university and we've got a number of children we'd like to bring. You know, do you have a special rate for children? Do you have a special rate for groups? Do you have a university discount? Whatever it might be. As I said, Shh, Brian, today's your birthday. We're going to Chuck E. Cheese. So, you know, and we get the birthday rate at Chuck E. Cheese. Um, so we, we do things that are not necessarily expensive. As I said, the kites cost a dollar. The kids have a ball with them. You know, we often just do things like we play games outside and then have a picnic lunch. So one of the best ones, I didn't bring it because, again, because we're doing this on video, I, I don't have all of the consent forms available, but it was Halloween. And the kids decided what they really wanted to do. We were carving pumpkins. And then they really decided what they wanted to do was wrap each other up like mummies and have mummy races. So we got a bunch of toilet paper, and they wrapped each other up. And we've got pictures of all these kids. like wrapped, They wrapped each other up as mummies and sort of had a great time sort of trying to have a race while they could barely move. So um, not a lot of, of money, or uh, time, but it is a lot of time. As I said, the advantage of doing this program in a university setting with graduate students and undergraduate students is I've got people who can make all those phone calls, line up those peers, help me be at the activity, and help monitor things. It's not something that's easy to do um, if you're in private practice. So I think the program might work without that component. I think it's more difficult to do without that component because you have to somehow engineer the, the generalization. And again, it's one of the reasons that 
we're piloting in a few weeks um, our, virtual, our virtual school, which is going to allow kids to practice at home on their home computer, um, interacting with a bunch of different characters who will present, who will interact with them, greeting them, giving compliments, receiving compliments, all the things we do in group, the avatars um, are programmed to do all of those things. And we've got adult avatars, child avatars, bullies, um, cool kids, um, smart nerdy kids. Um, we've got the gym teacher who tells you to do 20 push-ups. Um, so lots of different characters that the kids can interact with. And the specific reason for developing this is to take the place of the peer generalization sessions, which I think are the rate limiting factor in being able to put this whole treatment into effect. Okay. Um, just as I said, with the family involvement, accurate expectations of the time commitment, um, that we're not a babysitting service. When we say the activity's over at 1 o'clock, we don't want them to come at 1.30. Um, we certainly won't leave children, um, but we're not very happy uh, therapists when we have to stick around for an extra half hour, 45 minutes, because somebody isn't coming to pick up their child. Um, we do meet with them after each individual session to try and have the child tell what they did, how it went. We don't want therapy to be a secret from the parents. Um, we've talked about daily and, and weekly rewards, and we do have parents, we train them in how to deliver rewards. Again, immediately with a compliment, um, good job, so that they know what they're doing and how to make this program more effective. Parents often think that it's our job to fix the child. So one of the expectations we set up very early is we're all in this together, that this is a team effect. For a while, we'll be the lead, and toward the end, they have to be the lead. Okay? Um, I'm open for questions. I also understand if uh, we've had enough. And thank you very much for your attendance. It's, it's been a long day, but I appreciate being here with you. Um.